The Stanley Cup, a century of magic moments. at the Stanley Cup, I see names and stories. I see history, tradition, great achievement, and fun. Hello, I'm Ken Dryden, and in the next hour, we'll look at this grand old cup with its hundred-year history and see again why it's one of the most coveted in sport. When I look at it, I also see lots of magic moments. I see the dreams of thousands of young people who at least once have pictured themselves at hockey's ultimate moment of triumph, hoisting the Stanley Cup. I know I was one of them. I was on six Stanley Cup winning teams with the Montreal Canadiens in the 1970s, but years before that, as a kid playing ball hockey in our family's backyard in Islington, Ontario, I used to try to imagine what it would be like to hold the cup high. I didn't dream alone. It's this trophy, I think, which makes hockey's championship so unique in North American sports. It symbolizes a quest that stretches from boyhood to manhood. It's the symbol of the prize. And at that one special moment, when you want nothing more than to hold on to what you feel, it's there. To touch, to share, to connect you to all those names and stories that filled your childhood that are right here that will connect you to all those names yet to come. That's why people come here, I think, when they visit the new Hockey Hall of Fame in Toronto. It's to touch dreams. How did a simple silver bowl acquire such significance? The story begins in Ottawa with a British sports enthusiast, Lord Stanley of Preston. Hockey was relatively new when Lord Stanley, who was Canada's sixth Governor General, wrote these words from Government House in March of 1892. It would be a good thing if there were a Challenge Cup, which should be held from year to year by the champion hockey club of the Dominion. At that time, two of Stanley's sons, Edward and Arthur, played for Ottawa's Rideau Rebels. Believing that the Rebels were one of the best hockey clubs in Canada, the younger Stanleys convinced their father to donate a national championship trophy. I think a large part of the appeal of the Stanley Cup was formed in its early days when the trophy was a challenge competition. At that time, any team from in Canada could apply to play for the Stanley Cup. And indeed, challenges were received from various leagues, from the east and the west, and indeed from the north and the southern parts of the country. And this, I think, led to the trophy capturing the imagination of fans all over Canada. Lord Stanley purchased a squat silver bowl known as the Dominion Hockey Challenge Cup. But almost from its earliest days, the trophy was known as the Stanley Cup. The first winner was the Montreal Amateur Athletic Association in 1893. Soon, they were joined by teams like the Winnipeg Victorious, the Montreal Victorious, and the Montreal Shamrocks. Superstar Frank McGee played for hockey's first dynasty team, the Ottawa Silver Seven, who defeated 10 cup challengers from 1903 to 1906. Their best remembered victory came against a team from Gold Rush country. 
The Dawson City Klondikers are remembered as hockey's most glorious losers. They traveled 4,000 miles to play the Ottawa Silver Seven, who then were the powerhouse in 1905. But the thing that's most interesting about them is that their challenge came at a very, very trying time. Indeed, almost at a time in which the Stanley Cup would slip from its position as the preeminent trophy in hockey. The Silver Seven had held the cup for, for several years and through several challenges. And they were the toughest, meanest bunch of SOBs who've ever played the game. And indeed, teams from other senior leagues in Canada simply didn't want to play them anymore. They felt that the deck was too stacked against them to go into Ottawa and play. And really, at the time that the Klondikers challenged, there almost was no one else willing to play the, the Silver Seven. So their challenge was crucial to the continuation of Stanley Cup play. Dawson City was a mining boom town when its high-spirited hockey team set out on a 4,000-mile Stanley Cup odyssey. By dog sled and foot, they made their way to Skagway, Alaska, and continued to Vancouver by steamship. There, they rode the ribbon of steel to Ottawa for a two-game series with the Silver Seven. The Klondikers were crushed by a combined score of 32 to 4, but their quest helped keep the cup alive. New teams and leagues flourished in the years before World War I. The Montreal Canadiens, established in 1909, were led by goaltender George Vezina to their first Stanley Cup in 1916. It was to be the beginning of one of sport's greatest dynasties. The Seattle Metropolitans of the Pacific Coast Hockey Association won the cup in 1917, becoming the first U.S.-based team to win the trophy. Two years later, they would again challenge for the Stanley Cup. But before the series could be completed, tragedy would thwart their efforts. In 1919, a Spanish influenza epidemic ripped through North America and Seattle was particularly hard hit. The series was interrupted and this marked the only year in Stanley Cup play that the Stanley Cup was not awarded. The series was canceled, a number of players were hospitalized. Joe Hall never left hospital. He died a week later. A lot has changed since hockey's early days. The equipment, the treatment of injuries, the size of the prize, but not so much the players. In the playoffs, Everything gets heightened. Arenas fill fuller, crowds get louder, everyone talks about the game. It becomes inescapable. All that energy you had before, now you find more. Too tired to play, you play. So Mud Brunato in 1934, after 176 minutes, scores the only goal of a game. And injuries too painful get strapped up, and you find a way. For which hurts more, playing with pain or not at all? But more than that is the action itself. So absorbed in it, so preoccupied by it, pain can't get through. Pain is for tomorrow. The game is the body's best painkiller. Examples of Stanley Cup heroism abound, but one stands out, the story of Bob Bond. Bond's magic moment came in the sixth game of the 1964 Stanley Cup Finals between Toronto and Detroit. Gordy Howe was all over the ice that night there, and he kept hitting and shooting pucks, and he hit the goalpost quite a few times. And I, I always used to say a little prayer when he'd come down the ice. In the third period, with the score tied 3 all, and the Leafs trailing the series three games to two, Bond was hit on the ankle by a slap shot from Gordy Howe. Obviously injured, he was taken from the ice on a stretcher. Take him off the ice. From the moment it happened, Bond knew his ankle was broken. But once he reached the dressing room, he refused to allow his ankle to be x-rayed. Instead, he instructed the trainer to tape it tightly. When the teams returned to the ice for overtime, there was number 21, Bob Bond. For Bond, pain was for tomorrow. Then, in less than two minutes, it happened. And is wide. Langlois shifts it off the boards. Bob Bond lets it drive. It goes score! Bond's courageous goal forced Game 7, in which the Leafs captured the cup. His summer was spent in a cast. It was a great series all the way through. It could have gone either way, and uh, we were just lucky, you know, that uh, Bobby Bond just fired it, and uh, Terry Sawcheck was screened a little bit on it, and it went off him, and, uh, and that was it. Bond's heroism in games six and seven of the 1964 finals was matched by that of goaltender Charlie Gardner, who won the Stanley Cup with Chicago in 1934. He played much of that season in great pain, 
and was never able to rid himself of an infection that began with tonsillitis. By the last game of the finals, Gardner, too weak to stand, had to hold on to his goalposts to stay upright. Chicago defeated Detroit in double overtime. Two months later, Gardner died of a brain hemorrhage that emergency surgery was unable to control. But not all heroes of the Stanley Cup played in pain. Hockey pioneer Lester Patrick scored a cup-winning goal for the Montreal Wanderers in 1906. Then in 1928, as a 44-year-old manager of the New York Rangers, he suited up again and replaced his injured goaltender in Game 2 of the Finals. He allowed just one goal as the Rangers defeated the Montreal Maroons 2-1 to one in overtime. The Patricks have been called hockey's royal family. Lester, his brother Frank, sons Muzz and Lynn, and grandson Craig all have their names inscribed on the cup. Perhaps no player inspired his teammates like Bobby Clark, the captain of the Philadelphia Flyers during their cup-winning years of 1974 and 1975. Despite being a diabetic, he excelled in tough, high-energy hockey. You need a good leader to win the championship. And in those years, we had Clark, and Clark was a uh, tremendous leader. And I think if you, if you look back and look at the players and ask each individual uh, player, what was the, uh, really the secret of winning the Stanley Cup? And I think it was the um, uh, persistence. You know, we never gave up. The Flyers were the ultimate muckers and grinders and were guided by coach Fred Shiro, who was a master at extracting top performances from his players. The first Stanley Cup, we won at home in Philadelphia. And after uh, the game, then uh, I skated around the ice with uh, Clark holding the Stanley Cup, which is, uh, you know, people got on the ice, and it was just, just tremendous. The Flyers were defending champions when they met the Buffalo Sabres in a six-game all-expansion final in 1975. Bernie Perron continued his playoff magic, allowing the Sabres a total of just one goal in the fifth and sixth games of the series. Bobby Clark and his Flyers were back-to-back -back Stanley Cup champions. Then getting into the uh, dressing room, after and celebrating and drinking out of the uh, Stanley Cup, which is uh, uh, even today, you know, I'm thinking that that's, God, that's uh, 20 years ago, and it's, uh, it seems like it happened uh, last year. Just, just incredible feeling. There have been memorable mistakes in Stanley Cup play. Edmonton Oilers defenseman Steve Smith derailed the dynasty in Game 7 of the 1986 Smythe Division Finals. Fred did in the second period on Steve Bozak. Oh, they score! Oh, Steve Smith in attempting to get it out of his own zone, put it in the net! The Oilers, two-time defending Stanley Cup champions, were out. A year later, Edmonton was back. The Oilers needed seven games to defeat a tough Philadelphia Flyers squad that rallied to tie the series after trailing three games to one. Wayne Gretzky topped all scorers in the finals with two goals and nine assists for 11 points. Gretzky accepted the Stanley Cup on behalf of his teammates. He hoisted the trophy above his head to give the photographers a chance to shoot photos of the captain in the traditional victory pose, and then passed the trophy to Steve Smith. A year after leaving the ice in despair, on this night, Smith was indisputably the happiest man in hockey. This isn't the real Canadian's dressing room. It's a replica in Hockey's Hall of Fame. But except for the unmistakable smell of a dressing room, this is it. There's no real answer in here why the Canadians win so often. But sit here as I did and look at these plaques and you know you are part of something. You see names appear and disappear. Georges Vezina, Rocket Richard, Jean Béliveau. The faces of Hall of Fame players. Lines from a World War I poem. To you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. Tradition, success, responsibility. There's a message here. It won't win you the Stanley Cup, but it helps. The Canadians moved into the Montreal Forum in 1926. Led by speedy forwards Aurel Joliat and Howie Morenz, they won consecutive Stanley Cup championships in 1930 and 1931. 
By the mid-1940s, Coach Dick Irvin's attack was led by the punchline of Maurice Rocket Richard, Toe Blake, and Elmer Locke. Richard would be a constant for the team in the 1950s. The Canadians appeared in the Stanley Cup Finals every year from 1951 to 1960, winning six times. It was a star-studded team, deep at all positions. In goal, Jacques Plante. And up front, the stylish Jean Beliveau. Since a young boy, you dream to make your life in professional sport here in Quebec to wear the Canadian uniform and uh, to find yourself on a Stanley Cup team. Toe Blake became coach of the Canadians in 1955. Manager Frank Selke provided the players for Blake, who would lead his team to eight Stanley Cup championships in 13 seasons and an unprecedented five in a row from 1956 to 1960. The Canadians five cup dynasty was backstopped by Jacques Plante, a goaltending innovator who was the first to leave his crease to play the puck. In 1960, he would become the first goaltender to appear in the Stanley Cup playoffs wearing a face mask. Rich in offensive talent and capable of pinpoint puck movement, the Canadians developed a devastating power play orchestrated by Big Doug Harvey, a seven-time winner of the Norris Trophy as the league's top defenseman. The result was Stanley Cup wins against Detroit in 1956, Boston in 1957 and 58, and Toronto in 1959 and 60. Beginning in 1965, Maurice's brother, Henri Richard, the pocket rocket, led a revamped Montreal team to four Stanley Cup championships in five years. I'll tell you, I never looked for my name. I, I wish one day I'll look for my name on the cup. I never looked if my name was on it. I hope it is. <laughs> I'm sure it is. Richard's 11 cup wins are the most recorded by any player. Henri's superb career connected the Canadians' championship teams of the 1950s with their glorious squads of the 1970s. Coached by Scotty Bowman, this team had everything. Superb leadership. Great goaltending. Tough defense. And superstar right winger Guy Lafleur. The result was four consecutive cup championships from 1976 to 1979. And in three of those four seasons, the Canadians' highlight film is packed with big goals scored against the Boston Bruins. Perhaps the biggest was set up by Larry Robinson, whose pass sprung Lafleur to score the tying goal late in Game 7 of the 1979 semifinals. Robinson, along with Serge Savard and Guy Lapointe, was a wheelhorse on the era's greatest defense corps. This defense, combined with the all-star goaltending of Ken Dryden, made the Canadians the NHL's best at both ends of the ice. In the end, the 1979 finals belonged to a checking specialist. Bob Ganey, who epitomized the Canadians' particular combination of skill, hard work, and team play. It was a rookie-laden Canadians team that won the Stanley Cup in 1986, defeating the Calgary Flames in the finals. Unheralded goaltender Patrick Roy was sensational throughout the playoffs. The Canadians' legendary ability to manufacture wins was never more apparent than in overtime of Game 2 of the finals. Anything could happen early here. From the face-off, McPhee brings it in with Spurza, and he scores! Nine seconds is all it The Canadians' 1986 Stanley Cup win was the club's 23rd, eclipsing an all-sports record for most championships, previously shared with baseball's New York Yankees. In the 1992-93 playoffs, with new coach Jacques Demers motivating his troops, the Montreal Canadiens won the Prince of Wales Trophy by defeating the New York Islanders in five games. Now the Canadiens captain Guy Carpino, Stephen Solomon represents.
They met the Los Angeles Kings in the Stanley Cup Finals. The Kings won the series opener 4-1, to one, a game which featured great goaltending by the Kings' Kelly Rudy and the Canadians' Patrick Waugh. Pietro's in front of the net. Score! Off Gretzky! Mark on the third. Gretzky centered one. Score! Yari Curry's goal in the third period gave L.A. a 3-1 lead. And Wayne Gretzky sealed the win with an empty net goal in the final seconds. But here's Sandstrom. Empty net. Gretzky sharp. And there it is. The Kings were in control of game two as well, leading 2-1 with less than two minutes remaining in the game. However, Kings defenseman Marty McSorley was penalized for using an illegal stick setting up a Montreal power play. A penalty to Montreal if it's fair. And Marty McSorley, if he uses an illegal stick, which he did. Jacques Demers waiting for this moment. 1.45 remaining. 2-1 Los Angeles. Side. Defenseman Eric Desjardins scored to tie the match and then won it for the Habs with his third goal of the game in overtime. The Canadians' eighth overtime victory of the playoffs. Game three went into overtime as well, and Montreal continued its incredible victory streak by winning the game on John Leclerc's goal just 34 seconds into the extra frame. The Canadians win the game in overtime again! In game four, the Kings rebounded from a two-goal deficit. Oh, they a big save! Sorley is showing patience. The shot in, Gretzky around the net. Comes out, centering back. Marty McSorley scored the tying goal in the dying seconds of the second period to force the third consecutive overtime game of the series. Patrick Waugh was outstanding in the extra period, stopping ten shots before John Leclerc scored his second straight overtime winner to become the first player to score back-to-back -back overtime winners in the cup finals since the Rangers' Don Bones Raleigh in 1940. Montreal won game five on single markers by Patrick LeBeau and Kirk Muller and two goals by Rocky DiPietro. 3-1 Montreal. And a two-on-one right after it. Dion coming in. DiPietro scores! The Canadians won their 24th Stanley Cup title. The Canadians win the Stanley Cup! Patrick Waugh became the second goalie in league history to win the Conn Smythe Trophy twice by leading all goalies with 16 wins and a 2.13 goals against average. Just made the announcement for the whole world that the Canadians have won the Stanley Cup. And here's the great motivator, Coach Jacques Demers, won the cup in his first year behind the Habs bench as Captain Guy Carboneau and veteran Denis Savard hoisted the cup for the Montreal fans, which included the legendary Maurice Richard. The Canadians, who won an NHL record 10 overtime games in a row on their way to the championship, paraded the cup around the ice surface of the Montreal Forum and posed for the traditional on-ice celebration picture. Let's get together, boys, because without being together, we might not be here. Here they are. Hello, Canada and hockey fans in the United States. Reaching that big, broad audience that might never in its life see a game in person. The Stanley Cup has never been confined just to arenas. A hundred years ago, dispatches were sent from rinkside in Morse code to telegraph offices, its messages transcribed onto chalkboards for the big crowds that would gather outside. Still before radio, Toronto's first Stanley Cup contender, the Wellingtons, traveled west to play the Winnipeg Victorias. A signal was arranged. From Toronto's railway station, a steam whistle would sound. Two blasts for a win, three for a loss. The fans waited. Finally one blast, then another, then a third. The Wellingtons had lost. By the early 1930s, hockey's radio age had begun. The game's great voice was Foster Hewitt. He stood, perched in the gondola as he called it, high above the ice in Toronto's new Maple Leaf Gardens. In darkened parlors and kitchens across Canada, families stared at a big wooden box, 
at a burnt orange aura at the images of Hewitt's words. It was during these radio years the Toronto Maple Leafs became the NHL's new dynasty. It was Con Smythe who built the Leafs and Maple Leaf Gardens, their famed arena in downtown Toronto. Smythe's teams were tough. He demanded it. And aided by assistant manager Frank Selke, he proved to be a shrewd judge of talent, acquiring King Clancy from Ottawa for $35,000 and two players. By the time Maple Leaf Gardens opened in 1931, Smythe and Selke had revamped the Leafs lineup, combining veterans and young players in a way that would prove to be a Maple Leaf trademark in years to come. The Leafs were built around Clancy and another defenseman, Hap Day, and around the kid line, a forward combination made up of Charlie Conacher, Joe Primo, and Busher Jackson. The Leafs won the Stanley Cup in 1932, sweeping the New York Rangers. Turk Broda became the Leafs' starting goaltender in 1936. He played every game of the 1942 Finals, which saw the Leafs come back to win after trailing three games to none. This goal by Pete Langell put the Leafs ahead to stay in Game 7. Broda served in the Canadian Armed Forces in World War II, so the Leafs went with Frank Ulcers McCool, who recorded an unprecedented three consecutive shutouts in the 1945 Finals. In the late 40s, the Leafs became the first NHL team to win three consecutive Stanley Cup championships. They won again in 1951 on this overtime goal by Bill Barilko. Every game of the finals was decided in overtime. Barilko's goal has become a hockey legend. Bill Barilko was a promising defenseman, a really handsome, good-looking guy, almost a, a, a movie star type idol. He was called Hollywood Bill, and he was just on the verge of breaking into the top tier of defensemen in the NHL in 1951. That was Bill Barilko's last instant as an NHL player. Later that summer, he went off in a small airplane on a fishing trip into northern Ontario. The plane went down and he was never seen again. The body wasn't found for years. Toronto Maple Leafs come right back again. Over the line, Armstrong to Horton. Over to Duff. He turned it to the score! Picked Duff! The Leafs again dominated the NHL in the early 60s, led by tough-minded coach Punch Imlach. Goaltender Johnny Bauer was 37 years old when he won his first Stanley Cup in 1962. It was a long time coming for me, yes. It's, uh, it took quite a while uh, for me to, to achieve something that I always dreamed of, having my name engraved on the Stanley Cup. And uh, it was really a great thrill when that happened. Bauer's puck-stopping skills earned him the nickname of the China Wall. He faced Terry Sachuk in goal for Detroit in both the 1963 and 64 finals, which were won by the Leafs. It was 1967, Canada's centennial year, when Toronto next reached the finals. Sajak and Bauer were now teammates, as Imlac and a veteran lineup went on to upset the Montreal Canadiens in six games. The Leafs won the Stanley Cup with solid goaltending performances and the tireless work of playoff MVP Dave Keon. This unexpected win was the Leafs' 11th Cup since 1932. In 1992-93, with Cliff Fletcher in the manager's office, and Pat Burns behind the bench. The Maple Leafs had their greatest season in franchise history, setting team records for wins and points. Led by Captain Wendell Clark, the Leafs defeated Detroit and St. Louis to win their first Norris Division championship. Doug Gilmore, who became the first Leaf player since Daryl Sittler to finish among the top 10 scorers in the regular season, set a franchise record with 35 postseason points. Dave Andrichuk became the first player in NHL history to score at least 25 goals for two different teams in one season. Felix Puttman, the league leader in goals against average during the season, was at his best in the playoffs. In Game 7 of the Norris Division Finals, the Leafs shut out the Blues 6-0, thanks to key goals by Andrew Chuck and Gilmore and the solid goaltending of Felix Puttman. Well, in the two series, of course, Detroit and St. Louis, in the conference finals against Los Angeles, the Leafs battled the Kings through seven hard-fought games. The Leafs relied on the brilliant work of Felix Potvin, in addition to the opportunistic play of veterans Doug Gilmore and Glenn Anderson. Somehow, Smith has said, Donnelly is very fast. He's going in! Great save! He has room, not a move, able to shot. And he missed the rebound. Cleared away from the net. Here's another drive by Blake. Millen took a shot, Puck out of the net, another step by Puckman, and the... He gets up, Gilmore gets to the puck, Anichuk gets another kick at it, four or five times.
times they've recovered passes. They're knocked down. They're up. A gallant display of determination. And it ends up in a rich reward. The third goal of this game. McCollum keeps it in. The point shot. And Gilmore turns around and makes it clear. A key factor for the Leafs was the relentless forechecking of Borshevsky, Gilmore, and Andrichuk, which forced turnovers in the King zone and created numerous scoring chances for the Leafs. For that big scramble, look at Tony Granato who went all on his own and knocked Potman back. He may not call that a goal as you saw. Here's a break for Trent. Trent coming in. He scores. Robitaille got rid of it. Sandstrom. A back There's the shot, and you can see it was a knuckler. It was a knuckler ball. The turning point in the series came in game six. After Wendell Clark's wrist shot tied the score to force overtime, a Wayne Gretzky high sticking infraction against Doug Gilmore early in the extra session went unnoticed by referee Kerry Fraser. Gilmore was very close. Moments later, Gretzky scored the overtime winner to force game seven, which the Kings won five to four. And the Los Angeles Kings defeat the Maple Leafs. The New York Islanders were a team built through the NHL's annual draft of amateur players. The Isles entered the NHL in 1972-73, but by the club's fourth season, they were a 100-point team. Playoff disappointments followed until overtime of Game 6 of the 1980 Finals. Right on the second, Tonelli. Coming in with Nystrom. Tonelli to Nystrom. He scores! Bob Nystrom scores the goal! The Islanders win the Stanley Cup! Bob Nystrom's historic chip-in made winners of the Islanders. But it was the late season acquisition of veteran two-way center, Butch Goring, that had put the Isles over the top. Goring's value to his club was apparent in the 1981 playoffs when he scored 20 points, including five goals in the finals against the Minnesota North Stars. The Islanders won again and Goring was awarded the Conn Smythe Trophy as playoff MVP. The following year, the Islanders again advanced to the finals, this time sweeping the Vancouver Canucks, winning game one in overtime on this goal by Mike Bossy. It was a veteran Islander team that faced off against the NHL's new kids on the block, the Edmonton Oilers of 1982-83. Led by number 99, Wayne Gretzky, it was apparent that the young Oilers were the team of the future, but this spring, goaltender Billy Smith and the rest of the Islanders made it clear that the future had yet to arrive. Smith held the Oilers to just six goals as the Islanders swept again. He played his usual aggressive style to win the Conn Smythe Trophy and backstopped the Islanders to their fourth consecutive Stanley Cup championship. Captain Dennis Potman lifted the trophy for the fourth consecutive springtime. But Gretzky and the Oilers continued to improve and in 1984 again reached the finals against the New York Islanders. This go-round, the Oilers were ready Andy Moog and Grant Fuhr were strong in the Edmonton net and Gretzky had seven points in the finals. The team split the opening two games of the series before the speed and strength of the Oilers led them to their first Stanley Cup championship in five games. Edmonton was back for more the following season as the Oilers again needed just five games to eliminate the Philadelphia Flyers. Gretzky was a Stanley Cup superstar, setting a playoff record with 47 points in the postseason. The Oilers seemed set for a long reign as Cup champions until Steve Smith's unfortunate clearing attempt eliminated Edmonton in the second round of the playoffs in 86. A year later, the Oilers were battling a superb Philadelphia Flyers team in a seven-game Stanley Cup final. The Flyers won by one goal in games five and six, forcing a deciding game that was in doubt until Glenn Anderson drilled this 30-footer past Ron Hextall to seal the victory with less than three minutes to play. Edmonton made its fifth final series appearance in 1988 and played the Boston Bruins in a series that saw one game suspended when a power failure plunged Boston Garden into darkness. Wayne Gretzky was at his best in these finals, scoring 13 points and leading the Oilers to a sweep and their fourth Stanley Cup championship. It was difficult to imagine how the Oilers could be beaten. A 
27 years old, players like Gretzky and Marc Messier were still in the prime of their careers. But in August of 1988, Wayne Gretzky was dealt to the Los Angeles Kings in one of the biggest trades in the history of sports. Marc Messier inherited the captaincy of the Oilers and in 1990 led his team back to the finals. Once again, the Oilers faced the Boston Bruins. Bill Ranford had taken over as the team's number one netminder and he played at his best when the cup was on the line, allowing just eight goals against in five games. The Oilers received a boost in game one when a fresh Peter Klima hopped over the boards to score the winning goal after 55 minutes of overtime. Just two years after trading number 99, the Oilers found themselves hoisting the Stanley Cup for the fifth time in seven seasons. Most goalies are remembered for a save, a game, a moment. For me, it's being at rest. It's what playing for a great team does. Behind me, masks more recognizable than their wearers' faces. They're a goalie's identity. The Stanley Cup is the best time of year for a goalie to play. Energy sags through a long season, and when energy goes, defense goes too. Offense, the fun of a game, never gets tired. In the playoffs, when energy returns, shooters get harassed. Without time to do what they want, with one shot, not two, and fewer goals get scored. Goalies feel better, shooters feel worse, so goalies get better and shooters get worse. And everyone notices. It's wonderful. The Stanley Cup is a goalie's reward. Ken Dryden's name will always be associated with the Stanley Cup. He stunned the hockey world with his brilliant play as an unheralded rookie in the 1971 playoffs when the Canadians upset both Boston and Chicago. He was also in goal for Team Canada in the final game of the 1972 showdown series with the Soviet national team. Throughout his career, Dryden remained a student of goaltending technique and one of the most agile big men to ever play the position. He retired in 1979 with six cup wins in eight NHL seasons with the Canadians. Grant Fuhrer's acrobatic netminding kept the Edmonton Oilers close in the wide open games that characterized the club's all out attacking style in the 1980s. Fuhrer was frequently left unprotected, but his quick feet and glove hands usually could make the first save. He played in almost every game during the Oilers' four cup winning years in the 1980s and is credited with 56 of Edmonton's 62 wins during these playoff campaigns. Billy Smith's playoff average of 2.73 goals against per game is one of the lowest recorded during the 70s and 80s. Smith challenged opposing shooters and made it very clear that any player who ventured too close to his goal crease would pay a price. With Smith in goal, the Islanders won 16 games and lost only three during their four consecutive Stanley Cup Final Series victories from 1980 to 1983. Bernie Perrant was the bedrock upon which the Philadelphia Flyers Stanley Cup championship teams were built. For two seasons in the 1970s, he was the NHL's dominant goaltender, earning a first all-star team berth and the Vezina Trophy in the regular season, along with the Consmith Trophy and the Stanley Cup in the playoffs. In both campaigns, he led the NHL in wins, goals against average, and shutouts. The NHL's all-time shutout leader was Terry Sawchuk, who blanked his opponents 103 times in regular season play and 12 more times in the playoffs. If you didn't score early on Terry, you were in trouble. You know, he just got better and better. Sawchuk was a key contributor to three of Detroit's four cup wins in the 1950s. He joined the Maple Leafs and claimed his fourth Stanley Cup in 1967, splitting the goaltender's job with the ageless Johnny Bauer in the finals. I can remember one year we won the Stanley Cup. We won it in eight straight. And in four games at Olympia, there wasn't a goal scored on our hockey club. Now, granted, Terry Sawchuk didn't do that all himself because we had a tremendous hockey club. And, but that was the type of a goaltender he was. He was so good that I think if you had a handful of rice and you threw it at him, he'd get every kernel that you threw at him. 
The Olympia was the home rink of the Detroit Red Wings, the club Jack Adams built. In 1950, the Wings reached the finals for the third consecutive year. Their opponents, the New York Rangers, were forced from Madison Square Garden by the arrival of the circus. Despite playing the entire series on the road, the Rangers took Detroit to double overtime in Game 7 before Pete Babando won it for the Red Wings. In the 1954 and 55 Stanley Cup Finals, Detroit met the Montreal Canadiens, winning both series in seven games. Ted Lindsay was one of Detroit's most productive forwards and was a key contributor to both Stanley Cup victories. This is the greatest honor in the world to win the Stanley Cup because you're recognized as the best. Uh, recognize it was a team effort. There's no one individual, uh, no matter who he is, that can achieve the Stanley Cup. The Red Wings were talent rich, starting in goal with Terry Sawchuk and later Glenn Hall, shown here. Up front, Ted Lindsay played on a forward line with the incomparable Gordy Howe, who at a time when NHL defenses were at their toughest in the early 1950s, posted seasons of 43, 46 and 49 goals. The tradition of carrying the Stanley Cup around the rink, I think, goes back to Ted Lindsay in 1950. He was captain of the Red Wings. They clinched at home. And at that time, of course, there was no glass along the sides of the rink. And so fans there could lean right out onto the ice. And Lindsay, wanting to share the Stanley Cup triumph with the Detroit fans, picked up the cup and carried it over to them. Through the 70s, it was really only the captain of the team that would carry the cup around the ice. The others would follow with him in a pack, and then they'd have their fun with the trophy in the dressing room. But as the game has evolved and into the 1980s, the tradition has come up that every player gets to fulfill his fantasy, and every player gets a moment with the cup. And now I don't think anybody skates a complete lap, but everybody on the team, from the substitute goalie to the captain to the biggest star, gets a few seconds with it. Just as the game has changed, so too has the Stanley Cup trophy. Lord Stanley paid less than $50 for this squat, silver-plated bowl in 1893. But right from the start, winning teams would add bands and collars to the trophy so that they could engrave their names on it. By the 1940s, the cup had become a tall, stovepipe affair. But even this trophy was soon filled with players' names. The current Stanley Cup, with its big silver barrel, was built in 1957. Even this cup eventually was filled, requiring a new band that was added in 1992. Over the years, much of the work on the trophy was performed by Montreal silversmiths Arno and Carl Peterson. Today, engraving and maintenance of the Stanley Cup trophy take place in one of the oldest sections of Montreal. From 79 on, I began stamping the cup, which lasted through a decade uh, until Louise Saint-Jacques took her turn and she began in 1990. I think it's a great privilege to work on this unique trophy. To my eyes it's the finest trophy in the world. There is no other trophy like it and uh, it will re always remain that way. I don't think anybody can compete with a trophy like this. It's, it's unique. It, nobody can reproduce this. The Stanley Cup has certainly been in some unexpected places. Uh, it was drop-kicked into the frozen Rideau Canal in Ottawa early in its life and fortunately was found there the following morning. It was left by a roadside in the 1920s when players in the Montreal Canadiens, tipsy after celebrating their victory, had to pile out of the car and, and, and push it up a steep hill in Montreal and it was left there for several hours. Also in the 20s, it was left in a photographer's studio and forgotten for almost a whole year. And when finally it was remembered and the players went back to retrieve it, they found it filled with earth with geraniums planted in it. In 1961, when the Canadiens' five-cup string had come to an end and the trophy was in the Chicago Stadium because the series could end that night, a Montreal fan cracked open the display case hoisted the cup over his shoulder and headed out of the Chicago Stadium. He was apprehended by police and, and said, in explanation for why he had taken the trophy, he said that simply that the trophy be belonged in Montreal.
most fans, the Stanley Cup happens only right here on their television screens. And for them, each part of the season is a special test. Consistency, discipline, durability through the grind of six months of games. In the Stanley Cup, shorter, intense, head-to-head, -head, every second night, one team against another. No secrets, no surprises, just doing it with a season on the line. And if tonight works, tomorrow will be harder, because tomorrow he'll adapt, and so must you. Sometimes it's the non-stars, unnoticed, unaccounted for, who sneak to the fore, for the first time, for the only time. Great new stories to tell. But gradually, the weaker teams disappear. It becomes the best against the best, the ultimate test. In the Stanley Cup, great players prove their greatness. Wayne Gretzky has never missed the Stanley Cup playoffs in each of his 14 NHL seasons. He is a five-time playoff scoring leader and in 1993 became the first player to score 100 goals in playoff competition. Throughout his career, Gretzky has been able to dominate in important games. He holds or shares playoff records for most game-winning goals, most three or more goal games, and most points in one postseason. Gretzky's magic is that his success flows from impeccable hockey instincts. Other players are bigger, stronger, or faster than he is, but no one is as aware of the game around him as Gretzky. This goal on October the 15th, 1989, gave Gretzky the NHL's career point-scoring lead, surpassing Gordie Howe's mark. Howe had been Gretzky's hockey hero when he was a kid. Gordie Howe's teammates were quick to give him the nickname Power when he joined the Detroit Red Wings in 1946. Howe was a smooth skating big man with soft hands and an enormous reach. He was soon known as one of the strongest and most durable men in hockey. I had the opportunity to play with the greatest hockey player that's ever played as far as I'm concerned. Howe was just a complete hockey player. The amazing Gordie Howe appeared in 10 Stanley Cup finals in a career that spanned five decades. Mario Lemieux is another big man with superb puck handling skills. Mario emerged as the NHL's most potent scorer in 1987-88. His long reach and puck handling ability combined to make him extremely difficult to stop. He was the NHL's top playoff scorer and was named winner of the Conn Smythe Trophy as MVP in back-to-back -back playoffs. Lemieux's Pittsburgh Penguins won the Stanley Cup in both of these years defeating Minnesota in 1991 and Chicago a year later. Despite being hampered by a wrist injury, Lemieux's 15 goals in 16 games ignited the Penguins' attack en route to the Stanley Cup. Lemieux's size and skill have always sparked comparisons to Jean Beliveau, who was an all-star in Quebec before signing with the Canadians in 1953. His big stride, upright skating style, and almost regal bearing made him one of the NHL's most distinctive figures during the 1950s and 60s. He scored a career-high 47 goals in 55-56, his third full season in the league. The best playmaker I would, uh, that I played against uh, has to be Beliveau. Jean Beliveau was a tremendous leader and tremendous uh, hockey player. A 10-time Stanley Cup winner, Beliveau's five-goal performance in the 1965 Finals versus Chicago earned him the Conn Smythe Trophy in the first year of this new award. In 1993, he retired as the Canadian Senior Vice President, 40 years after signing his first contract with the club. Mike Bossy added a new dimension to the New York Islanders' offensive attack. Until his arrival, the Isles had depended on sustained offensive pressure to grind out goals. With Bossy, they now had a sniper, a trigger man, who could snap the puck past opposing goaltenders. In three of the four cup wins by the Islanders, Bossy was the NHL's leading goal scorer in the playoffs. He won the Conn Smythe Trophy in 1982, scoring seven goals in the finals. Bobby Orr is the only defenseman to win the NHL scoring championship and was the first player to record 100 assists in a season. In addition to this scoring prowess, he was a superb defender and won the Norris Trophy as the NHL's best defenseman in eight consecutive seasons. The Bruins missed the playoffs in eight straight years, and it was Orr who brought Boston back to the top. His overtime goal in 1970 gave the Bruins their first Stanley Cup since 1941. Not out. Bobby Orr, behind the net, the status, and Orr! 
Maurice Richard also thrived in overtime. 33 years after his retirement, he still holds the playoff record for overtime goals with six. The Rocket was one of the strongest players in the NHL and simply knew how to get the puck past opposing goaltenders. For 18 seasons, he was the engine that drove the Montreal Canadiens. Maurice didn't have to, uh, to speak. The only thing we did was look at him and everything was in his eyes. The, uh, the desire, the determination and also the pleasure of scoring goals. No player in the NHL has come close to Richard's record of 34 goals scored in the pressure cooker that is the Stanley Cup Finals. In 1944, he scored five goals in his second playoff game and closed out his magnificent career with this, his 82nd and final playoff goal in the 1960 Finals. Canadian's manager, Frank Selke, described the rocket this way. His dark eyes glowed like embers as he bore down on the opposing goaltender. More than any other player, the rocket epitomizes the passion and fury of the Stanley Cup. Ask any players who, who had a great career in the league who never won it. They're all going to tell you, yes, I had a great career, but there's something missing. And that's the Stanley Cup. More than any other player, perhaps, Rocket Richard embodied the spirit of this cup. The goals, the points, they mean nothing, he once said. The only thing that matters is the Stanley Cup. In the past hour, we've seen in eyes and heard in voices its real story. And I've had the chance to stand near it again. As I said at the beginning, I've played on cup-winning teams. But in the 1970s, the captain received the Stanley Cup hoisted it above his head and did his lap of triumph. And there it ended. Six times we won, six times I watched. Now it gets passed from hand to hand, just as it should. Many years ago, I was the boy who dreamed. Then I was the young man who realized that dream. And now I'm the man who dreams again. I'm not watching anymore.